Now let me teach you a little Greek here for you. How many people want to learn a little Greek here? How many people like Greek food? How many people like Greek uh, pizza? Very good. All right. So the word I'm going to teach here today is thusia. Why don't you say that with me? Thusia. T-H-U-S-I-A if you're taking notes. This is the Greek word for sacrifice. It's the noun version of the Greek word, not the verb version of the Greek word, the noun. And it really basically means the act of offering. I'm offering something. Objectively, it's that which is offered. In the Old Testament, it was about animals being sacrificed in the temple or in the tabernacle or for the sins of the people. Metaphorically, in the New Testament, it speaks of our bodies as being a living sacrifice. Paul the Apostle says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, for this is your reasonable service of worship. That's Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. And we have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that if we're going to live for Jesus that we have to make sacrifices because Christ demonstrated a lifestyle of sacrifice. And since he is the master and we are the servants and the servants are not greater than the master, then we too must embrace a lifestyle of sacrifice. And sacrifice hurts, otherwise it wouldn't be a sacrifice. I want to encourage you to recognize that this is a part of who God has called us to be. And when we come to appreciate what it was that Christ did for us on a cross, giving himself as our sacrifice and opening to us a greater blessing, we will come to understand the importance of us also being a living sacrifice so that our sacrifice would also be a blessing to others. And more specifically, a blessing to those that are closest to us. So this chapter presents a detailed contrast between the old covenant sanctuary, that's the tabernacle, and the new covenant heavenly sanctuary where Jesus is today. This contrast makes it clear that the new covenant sanctuary is both superior and eternal. So Father, I pray your blessing now upon the word as we get into it today. Open up your hearts, open up the hearts and minds of those who will hear the word so that it'll be relevant to their life. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said. Verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 9, if you have your Bibles. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. Now this word or this phrase, first covenant, references the Old Testament covenant that God made with Moses. It was centered around the tabernacle, later the temple, and its ordinances, which were religious rites and ceremonies that pertain to the earthly temple. I'm going to give you five reasons why the earthly sanctuary is inferior to the heavenly one. Reason number one, the Old Testament earthly sanctuary was a physical temple. It was made by men. Even though God's glory filled the Old Testament temple, it was still constructed by men who used earthly materials. This temple was limited. It needed constant repair. It was, it was limited geographically. It could only be at one place at one time, and it belonged to the nation of Israel and not to the world. So only so many people had access to this plan of salvation. Number two, the Old Testament earthly sanctuary was a prototype of something greater. Let's read on in verses 2 and 3. For a tabernacle was prepared. The first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which was called the holiest of all. You see, the furnishings of the tabernacle carried a spiritual meaning. They were patterns of things to come. The phrase, the first part, refers to the first division of the two divisions of the tabernacle. The first being the holy place, and the second division was called the holy of holies, where the ark of the covenant was kept. Each division or each room had a specific furnishings that were used for specific purposes. I'm talking about the Old Testament temple. In the holy place stood the seven-branched golden candelabra, the lamp stand that was fueled by oil on a burning wick. This was also known as the lampstand. 
This uh, produced the necessary light for the holy place since there was no windows or open doors to provide any ambient light for this room. You should know that the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. In the New Testament, the church is that light and Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus said it himself, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness the light of life. We are believers in Jesus and we are to shine as lights in this world. I want to encourage you that you guys are like that walking candelabra, that seven branched candelabra, that lampstand where you bring the light of God's glory with you wherever you go. I want to encourage you to recognize the importance of you being the light because I can tell you people in the world that don't know Jesus do not show Christ's light. That's our job to be the light We're the flavor, we're the salt of this earth. And I believe that as long as we're here, we can make a difference. I know crazy things happen. People are shooting at cops and people are dying. There's terrorist attacks and we got the political hoopla going on right now. I get it. People are a little bit stressed, but we're still the light. And we bring that light with us wherever we go. So I want to challenge you not to succumb to any fear or anxiety that all this may manifest, even in the coming week. But you stand firm and you let let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And that will bring glory and honor to the Father in heaven. Amen. I encourage you with that this day. Paul the Apostle reminds us in Philippians chapter 2, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God, without faults, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. And we're to hold fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. In other words, Paul the Apostle is basically saying, I'm up in heaven, and I'm going to go, Woohoo! come on, New Testament church, you can do it. I gave you the best I could. I gave you my writings. I gave you most of the New Testament. Now live it, and I'm cheering you on so that you can come home, and I can rejoice with you that you have ran your race well. Isn't that great? The Apostle Paul cheering you on. Of course, it would be nice to see the Apostle Paul when we cross the veil, but I'm looking for Jesus. Amen. How many people are looking for the Lord? And maybe you're looking for some, there you go. Praise the Lord. Maybe you're looking for a loved one who's passed away that you kind of miss. And when you step across the veil, you'll see them in their glorified body, not as they were when they were here. That's very encouraging for the, non, or for the believer, not so for the non-believer, because they sorrow without hope. Just as the candelabra illuminated the holy place in the Old Testament tabernacle, so Jews were to illuminate the world, their world, with God's love and God's statutes. In like manner, in the New Testament, just as Jesus is the light of the world, so his church, that's you and I, where the New Testament tabernacle is to shine as lights within this world, within our world. We're the light. Now let me give you a little eschatology here. The prophet Daniel said it this way in Daniel 12, 3. And you got to read the whole chapter to get what he's saying. But he basically says that those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Now, in context, Daniel is referencing the New Testament church and tribulation saints living in the latter times who will be blessed by God for being that light to the world at that time. People say, well, I have a hard time with that. Well, read the chapter, break it down. It's pretty self-explanatory that the prophet was looking at a separate group of people that lived in the future in the latter days, a separate group that could say that their names were written in the book of life. The only way you get your name in the book of life permanently is if you accept the Christ and die in a relationship with the Lord. That's a powerful picture for all of us. And I want to challenge you to be good stewards with your faith. You see, in this same room, the holy place, was not just the candelabra that lit up the room, but there was a table with 12 loaves of fresh bread on it, known as the table of showbread. Now, the best way I can explain this is, has anyone ever been to Subway, the the sandwich shop, not the thing you ride in underneath the earth? 
And you go there and you see this bread that's baking in the oven and it smells so good and it's fresh and you know you're going to have a sandwich and it's going to be fresh. Well, this table, they had 12 loaves of bread on it and they cooked these breads once a week. And then they take the old loaves off and the priests would eat them in the, in the room and they put new loaves on. And that was known as the table of showbread. And the message was that God was providing for all of the 12 tribes of Israel. The message for you today is the same God that provided for the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament is the same God who in his name, Jireh, provider, provides for you in the New Testament. Amen? Sometimes we tend to worry about things we have no control over and God's saying, look, I got you covered. You know, I, I have you covered. These loaves were called the bread of presence and only the priests could eat this bread. They were required to eat it in the sanctuary. Does anybody remember when David was hungry and his men and he went in and he ate the, the bread? And hey, you can't do that. You got to be a priest. Well, maybe I am. Think about it. So this act reminded Israel that God's presence is what sustains the 12 tribes. And today we see Jesus Christ as the bread of life given to the whole world. John chapter 6, verse 32. Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. This is similar to what happened in the wilderness with the manna falling from heaven. It's a prototype of God's provision for his people. This is not just physical, but spiritual. It's not just a temporary provision. It's an eternal provision. And this is why Jesus stressed the point to his people not to worry about the needs of your body because God was our sustainer, our provider, the bread of life. Matthew chapter 6, 31, Jesus says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? And what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after these things Gentiles seek. The word Gentiles basically means non-believers. So if you worry about stuff like that, you're basically worrying like a non-believer. But we're believers. We have faith in God through Jesus Christ. And because we have a faith, we choose not to worry. For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, you don't want to be the person that worries yourself to death. Do you know anybody that worries a lot? always worried. Oh, what about that? Oh, I have to worry about that too. Oh, I have no control over that. So I'll worry about that as well. Do you know anybody like that? I'm not talking to anybody here, but you might know somebody who's like that. And some people worry themselves to death. They literally, oh, I'm worried about this and this and all, oh, and their heart just gives out and they die. But praise God, they're saved. Amen. The problem is they get to heaven and Jesus goes, what are you doing here? You're early. Well, I worried. I told you not to worry. I got it covered. Anybody want to have that conversation with Jesus? Nobody, right? And stop worrying. Come on now. You can do it. If God can provide 12 loaves of bread, fresh bread in the sanctuary in the Old Testament as symbolic, surely he can provide for you. We have to believe by faith. But Pastor Rob, you don't know. I don't tithe. I'm, I'm a, not a tither. Well, you know, God will work with you on that process. You'll see. We'll get to that place. I want to encourage you to recognize who you are in Christ. Stand firm and move in the direction of your faith. There's a lot of people out there that say it, but don't do it. We want to be people that not only say it, but we do it. I mean, very good. Let's continue on. The golden altar also stood in the holy place, which was positioned just in front of the veil that divided the two parts of the tabernacle. Verse 4a says this, which had the golden censer. Now the word censer translates or used here as a device for burning incense. It's better translated altar. Because when you think of censer, you think of some priest in a robe spinning a censer around with smoke coming out of it, you know? But the golden censer or the golden altar 
it was not in the Holy of Holies, but its ministry pertained to the Holy of Holies. See, on the annual Day of Atonement, the high priest used coals from this altar to burn incense before the mercy seat behind the veil inside the Holy of Holies. Each morning and evening, a priest burned incense on this altar. David suggested that the burning of incense by the priest was a picture of prayer ascending to God. In Psalms 141, verse 2, Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. This is a picture of us positioning ourselves physically in a way where we speak prayers to the Lord. If you want to know what that looks like, the last time you prayed, you really prayed to God for something or you just worship the Lord, it's like a incense that goes up. And I know we have a smoke machine here. Actually, it's a haze machine and it kind of smokes the place up and it's kind of cool and whatever. But what I'm talking about is the real deal. It's not a prototype. That's really your prayers going up before the Father and the kingdom of heaven. Um, Paul the Apostle he paints a picture of how prayer reminds us of how Jesus intercedes for us continually. In Romans 8, he says, Who shall bring charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore, who was also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Amen? Thank God we have Jesus Christ making intercession for us because some of you guys really need the intercession and you know who you are. The picture, I should say, the picture of things happening within the Old Testament tabernacle speak to a future work of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Let's read on in your Bibles, verses 4b and 5. And the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, you should know, it was a wooden chest, three foot nine inches in length by two foot three inches in width by two foot three inches in height. It's like a big box. On the top of the chest was a beautiful mercy seat made of gold with two angels, each one bowing towards each other, and the tips of their wings were touching. And in the center, this was the throne of God in the tabernacle where God's glory illuminated continually between the angels' wings like the Shekinah glory of God. If we can go on a time machine back in time and see it in the, in the temple, you'd see this beautiful Ark of the Covenant, the one like on Indiana Jones, if you saw that movie. Did you guys see that movie? Okay, kind of like that. But in between, there's this illuminating light, kind of like, kind of like on Star Wars. You see Star Wars with the lightsaber? You guys with me? Kind of like that between. And that represented the presence of God, the glory of God that was illuminated. But that represented God's holiness in the Old Testament. If we were to go there today, well, we're in the New Testament. We're under the blood. Now we have access. But in the Old Testament, only one priest once per year. And he had to have a special cleansing ceremony that he had to go through. And let me tell you something. If he messed up, he dropped dead. They drag him out. Up, oh, this guy didn't make it. Okay, Larry, you're up. Think about that. <laughs> Right? The psalmist says it this way. If you have your Bible, Psalm 80 and verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherub, shine forth. That's a picture of that. In Psalm 99 and verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. In both of these passages, it's said with explanation. In other words, there's a shouting, there's an excitement because the God of the armies of the hosts of heaven, the God that created everything is he dwells, his presence dwells in this very special place. It's very holy. Here we can see it, have a better understanding of the Old Testament tabernacle manifest within the writing of these Psalms. So the excitement of the psalmist is evident even in his writing. Now on the day of atonement, the blood was sprinkled on this mercy seat to cover what was inside the ark. That is the two tablets of the law, that's the Ten Commandments, that golden pot of manna and Aaron's rod that budded. These three items were inside the ark. If you ever go on a game show and they ask you that question, you know what to tell them. You got it right here in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, okay? God did not look at the broken law. 
He saw the blood. In the New Testament, Jesus is our mercy seat. He's the propitiation for our sin. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 2, and he himself, referring to Jesus, is the propitiation for our sin, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. In Romans 3, 23, Paul says, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is Jesus Christ with whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. Propitiation is a necessary substitute. A person who was qualified to be the sacrifice is the propitiation. Unlike the blood that was shed in the Old Testament sanctuary, Christ's New Testament blood, that sacrifice in his own blood doesn't just cover our sin, but it removes it completely. Amen? How many people like to know that when you have a stain on your carpet, you don't want to just cover it, you want to remove it? I speak as a man with a puppy in the house. (laughs) Think about that, all right? You're walking through the house, uh uh-oh, we have to remove that. We don't want to just cover it. I'm trying to give you visual pictures of what your sin looks like in the presence of a holy God. I hope this is working for you. I want to help you to understand that in the New Testament, Christ wipes that sin away completely. And thank God he does, because it gives us access to the Father. Amen? I encourage you with this. There are many spiritual truths wrapped up in these three pieces of furniture and what they mean. The two tablets of stone represent God's law for his people. The jar of manna represented God's supernatural provision for his people. And Aaron's rod that budded infers his approval for the Levitical Old Testament priesthood. All of these are types and shadows, and they're valuable. But all of this was only Old Testament symbolism for a future spiritual reality. This is another reason why the tabernacle of the Old Testament was inferior to the New Testament heavenly one. Number three, the Old Testament earthly sanctuary was inaccessible to the people. It was limited. Verses six and seven, the Bible says, now when these things had been prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, but not without blood, which which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. You see, The Jews didn't necessarily gather in the temple to worship. See, the priests and Levites were allowed into uh, the tabernacle, but not the people from the other tribes. They had to remain in the outer court. The population of people had to remain outside the temple compound. Although the priests ministered in the holy place each day, only the high priests entered the holy of holies. And then only once per year when he offered a sacrifice for his own sin as well as the sins of the people on the day of atonement. Now in contrast, the heavenly tabernacle is open to all the people of God and to any time we have access eternally through Christ who made a way for us to get back to the Father. Okay, here's a codicil for you. This is a Rob Lee break in the sermon. This is a prophetic word going forth. Some of you people are concerned about when the rapture is going to happen in context of the tribulation. Now, you haven't thought about it too much, but lately you've been thinking about it a lot more for obvious reasons. It seems like every time I turn on the news, there's some kind of a special report of some crazy thing that's happening here and happening here. Now, I'm going to tell you as your pastor, you're going to continue to see that. You're going to continue to see it because it's part of the characteristic of the world just before the return of the Christ for his church. Now, I want you to know something. If Jesus himself tells us in Matthew 24, see that you are not troubled, for these things must come to pass, you might want to take his advice. Okay? I'm talking to somebody here, so just listen. I'm going to give you something. We're talking about the Day of Atonement. Ten days prior to the Day of Atonement was the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets, known as Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. It's the Jewish New Year, where a new year begins Rosh Hashanah is Feast of Trumpets. Ten days later is Day of Atonement. Ten days. It's logical to assume that if the rapture of the church occurs on Rosh Hashanah, some year, we don't know when, no one knows the day or the hour, it's equally logical to assume that ten days later is the beginning of the tribulation. That is, the Antichrist signs this peace treaty with Israel and starts the clock. I'm just speaking, uh, uh, I'm trying to, 
paint you a picture. I'm not saying that's how it's going to go down. I personally believe that's how it's going to go down. But the reason why I'm saying this is I want you to understand that one event happens before another event. Now, the Bible always interprets itself. And we read in Revelation chapter 2 where Jesus says, See that I will keep you from the hour of trial. He says specifically the 10 days of suffering that will happen on the earth. Now, he's referring to a time where there will be 10 days of suffering. A lot of Bible scholars believe it's the 10 days that happen after the rapture before the start of the tribulation. It's just a theory. It's called the 10-day theory. What I'm trying to convey to you in the context of this sermon is this. The day of atonement is known as the day of blood. It's a day of judgment. It's going to happen. But you and I have already been judged. We've been found guilty. And so we had to have someone pay for our our guilt. And that was Jesus Christ. And when he paid for it, guess what? The stain was removed. We are no longer guilty. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. Get excited about that. I want you to know something. This picture of sacrifice right here. By the way, you guys like my new pointer? You can also talk in it. This picture of sacrifice right here is something I want you to grab. I want you to see it because when Christ makes a sacrifice, it sticks. It's permanent. The Old Testament sacrifice was not so. We're in a better deal here. I need you to get this because I don't want you to be Christians who are afraid, trembling in fear because of all the stuff you're seeing. I want you to stand firm and stand tall and walk by faith and recognize that God's called you to a standard of holiness that doesn't compare to this world's desire. Sure, there's a lot of things you can do to satisfy your flesh. I get it, but we make the sacrifice because our master made the sacrifice and he set the day and he set the the example for us to follow that we want to walk in sacrifice. We want to recognize a lifestyle of sacrifice because we know there's a greater good that's going to come from it. I want you to see that for what it's worth. Amen? In contrast, the heavenly tabernacle is now open to all the people of God at any time. We have access eternally through Christ who made a way for us to get back to the Father. Number four, the Old Testament earthly sanctuary was temporal. It wasn't eternal. Verse eight says this, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. In other words, the outer court of the tabernacle stood between God's presence contained in the Ark of the Covenant and the people who were outside. This was proof that God's redemptive plan for mankind was not yet complete. And as long as the priests were ministering in the Holy of Holies, or I should say the holy place, the way had not yet been open for the people to enter into the presence of God. We were restricted. And this is why when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says the veil that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies was torn from top to bottom. Matthew 27, verses 50 and 51 Make it very clear. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, from God to man. The earth quaked, the rocks were split. Now watch this. Young people always like it when I preach this because it's literally light night of the living dead. The graves were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into this holy city and appeared to many. Most people never read that passage. They're going, what in the world? Is that in the Bible? Because I saw that on a science fiction movie. It's in the Bible. What it means is people who recently had died, like Lazarus, they're in the grave. They come back to life. And you have to understand, they're not buried under the earth per se. They're in a tomb. That's how Jewish people did it. And they come back to life. They're tearing off these gray clothes and going, hey, what's going on? And they go back in and their friends see him. Hey, it's Larry. It's Sue. It's it's Jimmy. He's alive again. What happened? And they're able to tell him how Christ came down to Abraham's bosom, Sheol in the Old Testament, and ministered to them and then resurrected them. And everybody else who had gone on to paradise, but these guys were recent enough to come back and tell the story. And that's how we know what happened, because we had witnesses that were there. Isn't that cool? You and I don't have to go to Abraham's bosom. That place is empty, because the Old Testament temple, that's as far as you got. They were waiting for the master, the Messiah, to come and set those people free. Thank God for that, huh? Now, after that, 
There was no longer the need for the holy place or the holy of holies. So now a sinner who confesses Christ as their personal Lord and Savior can go directly into the presence of God and not be consumed. Isn't that great that you can do that? You can go in your prayer closet. You can go, dear Jesus, it's me, Larry. And all of a sudden, (laughs) Larry's dead. Hamburger helper to death by the presence of God. Isn't that terrible? Can you imagine? Lord, it's me, Susie. I've come to pray, (laughs) dead. Susie, consumed by fire. These are images that you're going, oh, Lord, what kind of doctrine is this? It's a doctrine that doesn't exist because Christ now gives us access into his presence. Amen? We will not be consumed. (laughs) Praise the Lord. I don't recall any of my kids ever saying, I don't want to pray because I'm afraid I'm going to be consumed by God's holiness. I don't recall ever hearing that. I don't recall somebody saying to me, I'm a real sinner. If I go into God's presence, he will kill me. I've had people say to me, I won't come to your church, Pastor, because if I do, I'm afraid the roof will cave in on all the people. That's pretty bizarre, because our roof has been holding up all this time. We've had a lot of sinners come and go from this place, trust me. We love you all, amen? All right, here's the last reason. Number five, the Old Testament earthly sanctuary was external only, not internal. As we learn from last week's message from Pastor Bobby, the internal manifests the external, which determines the eternal. What we do in this life is motivated by what's inside of us. And what we do in life determines where we will spend eternity. It's no different in the Old Testament as the people needed to be right in the sight of a holy God. Verses 9 and 10 say this. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who perform the services perfect in regard to the conscience concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Let me break this down for you. See, the sacrifices that were offered and the blood applied to the mercy seat could never change the heart of a worshiper. All the ceremonial significance of the Old Testament temple had nothing to do with moral purity. They were carnal ordinances that pertained to the outer man, but they could not change the inner man. In other words, you can go to church for 25, 30, 40 years, and it doesn't necessarily change who you are on the inside. It just means you go to church. But going to church doesn't make you a Christian. It just puts you in proper alignment to become one and to stay one. That's why it's important we understand this. You know, Jesus said it this way. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles him. Now, I don't think I need to explain that to everybody here because we all know how the body works. What goes in, what comes out. Are we clear on this? We don't need to talk about that in church. We all pretty much know what that's like, right? Some of you know more than others, right? Think about this. Whatever inward work God was doing in the lives of the Old Testament Jews would be manifest in how they behaved and obeyed just like us today. It has to be a choice. It has to be a personal choice. You see, in the Old Testament temple, as temporary as it was, it was a prototype for the heavenly temple. It represented by the Christ who came down from heaven to be our propitiation for sin. These five deficiencies of the Old Testament sanctuary, let's review quickly, that it was a physical temple made by man. It was a prototype of something greater. It was inaccessible to all the people, so it was limited. It was temporary only, not eternal. And it was external only, not internal. They are matched with five superiorities of the new covenant sanctuary, that is our bodies here on earth and the temple that is in heaven. How many people want to hear about those five superiorities? Come on back next week. I'll be glad to give them to you. Worship team, come on up. Somebody give God praise in the house. Amen? Praise the Lord.